Welcome, thanks for joining us. I'm David Larson. Uh, welcome to my YouTube channel. On this channel, we kind of look at uh, the current state of Christianity and, and problems that it's seeing in, in modern America and, and, uh, and ways to address that, often looking at uh, Christian virtues and also community as, a, as potential solutions to uh, kind of buttress things. Um, and in that vein, looking at community, we're talking to a few different communities and um, that people are starting and and um, in one Christian community that is in the process of um, getting organized is Father Thomas Ricks is starting a uh, community of the Holy Cross here in North Carolina where I live. Um, so welcome to Father Thomas Ricks, an Anglican priest. Um, and I guess just to start off, Father Ricks, if you would just say a little bit about your your background, how you how you became an, an Anglican priest. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, engaging in the conversation. So I actually have a pretty disparate background. I was born and raised a Baptist with a Baptist preacher's son, spent about 14 years as a Roman Catholic, and then ultimately in 2009, I believe it was, became an Anglican. And after many years of, uh, I already had my uh, graduate education in theology at that point. And after many years of kind of searching and trying to get to the right place vocationally, as well as ecclesiastically, a few years after becoming an Anglican, was ordained to first to the diaconate, of course, and then to the priesthood. Great. And uh, just out of curiosity, what were the step to be going from more of an evangelical sort of Baptist background to Catholic and then maybe from Catholic to um, Anglican. Was there was there specific motivations on those steps that would be easy to summarize or? There were a lot of them and you're right it is very hard to summarize it. I would probably have to write about a five or six volume work of systematic and historical th theology to trace that whole journey. <laughs> but um, I was just about to use the phrase, but to put it in a nutshell, and then I heard one of my graduate uh, school professors voice in my head because he used to like to say that any any theology that fits in a nutshell belongs there, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> which I strongly agree with. But to put it as succinctly as possible without hopefully doing too much damage to meaning and content, um, I have been probably since I was a teenager looking for the ancient faith, the primitive faith, the apostolic faith. And it was through reading the fathers and becoming aware of all of the many evolutions in Christian faith and practice uh, that brought me to where I am. Um, for those who are not uh, you know, technically inclined to matters of theology, we usually have a very positive uh, association with the word innovation these days. I'm bivocational and I make my living in the software industry, not as a priest. And so innovation in that field is a very good thing. Innovation in theology is a very bad thing, simply because we believe as Christians that the full and final self-revelation of God was made to humankind in the person, work, and redemptive sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so uh, Contrary to other areas of life where we seek constant innovation, we do the opposite in theology. We're always trying to get back to the authentics of apostolic faith and practice. Um, and then I guess on your uh, broader goal now, now that you're you're uh, Anglican priest and um, your your current uh, ministry is in New Bern, you said right, but your the community you're planning is is just north of there by a little bit still on the coast? We live in northeastern North Carolina. That's right. The association with Newburn is a parish, St. Bartholomew's, that's down there. They have not had a resident rector for some time. And so a couple of months ago, I started serving them on an interim basis. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. Could be short, could be longer. We're looking for a resident rector to go there, but that's where I'm, I'm serving currently. But what we're looking to do is to create something that in some way is you know, much more of an intensive commitment than membership in a parish church with community of the Holy Cross. So people are familiar with church membership and what that entails. And lots of people, depending on their background, are at least somewhat familiar with um, 
religious life in a religious order, either cloistered or non-cloistered and out in the world serving in some capacity doing the works of mercy. But most people have those two, two ideas, church membership and religious life in a religious order. And so they sometimes have trouble understanding, what is this that you're doing exactly? Because it's neither fish nor fowl. Um, we do have a lot of good content on the website that people can read about what some of the similarities and differences are. But essentially what we're trying to create is a community of people who are very dedicated to daily prayer. It's a very ancient tradition, which has been carried through in Anglicanism in a very pure form of a twofold daily office of prayer, morning prayer and evening prayer. Uh, the structure of it goes back, as we know it today, at least to the fourth century and was probably based on earlier prayer practices, first in Judaism and then in early Christianity. But as soon as it becomes legal and safe to have big public services, we see this uh, almost overnight emerge all over the Christian world, this twofold office of morning and evening prayer. Um, so there's a, a strong tradition of that. What we're looking to do is to gather people who feel vocationally called to a rigorous life of intercessory prayer. So we're looking to live as disciples in somewhat more of an intensive way than maybe typical church membership uh, necessarily entails, but at the same time, not necessarily focusing on a single profile as life in a religious order would entail. So religious order typically, of course, is celibate males or celibate females living in a community. We're looking to create a structure in which people of various ages and states of life single people, families, maybe people who have been widowed, uh, people at all stages of life but who feel that call to regular disciplined prayer and discipleship can come together and support one another in a community of that type. Um, you won't be selling off all your worldly goods and taking a vow of poverty as you would in a religious order. We anticipate that for a wide variety of reasons that we can talk about if you'd like, that people will continue to own their own homes and work their secular jobs if they're not retired and, and things like that, but be part of this, this community at the same time. Yeah. I saw some of the, uh, on your website, I was looking through that, um, some kind of parameters of what we are and what we aren't. And, you know, on the, what we aren't, you're saying we are not a commune and we're not a way of, um, escaping the, the modern world or we're not Luddites that want you to abandon all your technology. So it's, um, you know, helpful to see kind of on that end, you know, your people might have in their head certain images immediately of like saying maybe a monastery or maybe the Amish or maybe a commune or some things like that. But you're, what you're painting a picture of is um, people living um, in, in a kind of adjacent to each other, but not co-owning property other than maybe a common place to, to gather, but they're, their living arrangements and their jobs and all that is still to be uh, arranged by themselves. You know, you're not going to necessarily be assigning housing or things like that. You're just living nearby and then cooperating on a common life in prayer and works of mercy is, is part of it. And what else would you say with the common life together that you, you're trying to pull together would look like. Yeah, so there are two things that you talked about there, and I want to address them both in the, the order that you mentioned them. So I'll answer the question that you asked on the end, but I'm going to talk about a few other things that you brought up first. So one reason why I tried to spell out very clearly on the website some of the things that we are not looking to do uh, is, is really twofold. One, uh, besides the fact that people, like you say, have various images and preconceptions, and so I wanted to ward those off. Besides that, um, I really view this, like so many things in life, as a matter of calling. You know, as apostolic Christians, we believe that you don't simply decide to get married or not, but that as part of your Christian life and your particular gifts and what you're supposed to do for the Lord in the world, you are either called to marriage or called to celibacy. That's just one example. The whole question of property is another. I think there are people who are called to a life of formal poverty, owning nothing, being part of a community where everything is owned in common. There are certainly wonderful examples of that in many times and places throughout history. But once again, that's a matter of personal calling. And so if we make a linkage between a disciplined life of prayer and having that particular calling, I think we've made a mistake because we've linked two things that aren't necessarily linked. 
some people have a call to both and other people have a call to, to a life of discipline prayer, but not necessarily to poverty. Uh, so it's a matter of, of personal vocation. And so I wanted to let people know you don't have to have this, this whole package of things that you may associate with a religious order. You may not have all those callings to be part of what we're doing here. The second reason to be blunt is because there have been so many abuses in the history of the church and just of, of religious belief in general. Uh, I am not looking to make my living myself from this community. I don't make my living from my priestly service now. Um, I, I volunteer everything that I do as a priest and am self-supporting like St. Paul. Uh, we have a good biblical example of that. Um, and so I want people to feel very comfortable. I'm not asking you to give up your own control of your life. I'm not asking you to surrender access to your finances or your privacy or your decision making for your family or anything like that. Because like I say, I'm aware that there have been so many abuses of that kind of thing in history. So we want to be right up front that we're not asking anybody to uh, sign over their life to me or to the community or to anybody else. We're just looking to come together in prayer, and as you say, in some other things. I think anytime Christians come together as a matter of calling and pray diligently and regularly, then some things are going to happen. First of all, they're going to want to know their faith extremely well. So excellence of catechesis and theological exploration usually emerges from that. And also the works of mercy, both corporal and spiritual. Those are very, very important in the Christian life. I think most people are well-intentioned, but don't necessarily have uh, the means to have a systematic approach to doing the works of mercy. One of the things that I believe about this community is that the Holy Spirit uh, will do things with it once we come together that I don't know right now and that I don't need to know. I think there's a beautiful creativity to the work that the Holy Spirit does when Christians come together. So there may be particular acts of service, particular ministries, particular needs in the community. When you have people come together and pray, and the Holy Spirit is infusing not only those individual lives, but the corporate lives of the community, then we'll be nudged in one direction or another. And some of those, like I say, may be things that I don't anticipate. And I don't really need to. I think part of the, uh, the fun, if I can use that word, of Christians coming together is seeing what the Holy Spirit will then do infusing and motivating the community definitely and, and um so you mentioned that there have been abuses in the past but it also is important to you that we have community and i think you know i would agree with that i think that's a big uh maybe part of combating the individualism of america that sort of makes it difficult to be a christian and you know as a lone person sometimes that um is fighting against a whole culture by themselves but you know, in spite of all those kind of abuses, what was important to you about why, why was this such a important thing for you to do and how you got to that point to decide, you know, we need to, you know, create community around prayer and around works of mercy. Um, what brought you to that um, decision? That's a great question. So there's a few different things and you, you put your, your finger on one of my concerns, which is the extreme radical individualism and not just individualism, but autonomy. Autos, self, namos, law, being a law unto oneself, uh, that radical autonomy that we see creeping into all aspects of our culture. And one of the things that really is shocking to me is that, you know, there's certain types of people with uh, maybe agnostic or atheistic views or, you know, a certain worldview that we're, we're not surprised when they act in an individualistic or autonomous way. What's really shocking to me is that when we as Christians who should know better <laughs> act in very individualistic and autonomous ways. Um, there's, first of all, there's rampant in American culture, just a, a false sense of what it means to be the church. Um, there's even, you know, soteriology, which says, um, soteriology is the, the theology of how we are saved, for those who may not know the term. There's a soteriology basically that says Christ saves individuals. And then the church kind of emerges as an epiphenomenon of those individuals. But it's really the individual person who's the locus of salvation. Now, personhood is very important. But if you read the New Testament, you don't see just Christ saving individuals and then the church just sort of happens to come to be as a convenience for those individuals. Rather, the church, biblically, is the bride of Christ. 
and the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am saved as an individual person, but I'm saved in the context of being one cell in the body of Christ. It's not just the body of Christ sort of comes about as a convenience to those individuals that have been saved. So when we live in community, we're reflecting a biblical notion of the church, which is consistently referred to by those two analogies I've already mentioned, body of Christ and bride of Christ. Uh, my mentor in the priesthood used to like to say that uh, the church is not an organization. The church is an organism. And so when we create Christian community, we reflect that. We become kind of a microcosm of that much greater reality, the definition that Christ himself has given to his church as a living body. Um, I'm sure you've you've read the, the Benedict Option. I think that's been kind of popularized the idea of Christian community and also the the need for it, looking at the, you know, individualism. Was that something that um, that you read and were influenced by, or is that you were already kind of thinking on these issues a lot or about community? Well, a couple of things. Yeah, a couple of things I'd say in response to that. This is what we're doing at Community of the Holy Cross is definitely not in response to or inspired by that book, because the, the core idea I wrote the plan for the community as a draft probably five or six years ago, which I think is before the Benedict Option came out. Uh, and the kernel of the idea had really been in my heart for at least a couple of decades, maybe even longer. Um, but I think the book has created a really interesting moment. The success of the book has created all of these interesting dialogues and conversations. And so I think there, you know, the timing is right in the sense that there's this thing that the Holy Spirit has been doing in my heart for a few years. And then all of a sudden, everybody's talking about Christian community and what that means and what it should look like and what it shouldn't look like. And so I think it's just it has helped us to uh, have a you know, this particular cultural moment when people are interested in the, the whole concept, whether they feel called to join our community or not. It's interesting, as I've been in dialogue with people all over the country and indeed in a few foreign countries about their interest in joining community of the Holy Cross. I've had wonderful conversations with a lot of really interesting people, um, so much so that I think, wow, these, these folks are interesting enough, and there's such spiritual and intellectual depth that if, if we do come together as a community, it's going to be really amazing. Now, obviously, not everybody that I talk to as an interest is going to ultimately uh, discern a call to join us, but as I've had these conversations, it's been a, a interesting and amusing uh, the way that Rod Dreher's work has come up. Because, and I'm going to simplify and give kind of a valorized version of what people say, just for simplicity's sake. But I have people contact me and say something along the lines of, oh, thank God you're actually doing what Rod Dreher proposed. And I'll have other people contact me and say, I've read everything on the website, and thank God you're not doing what Rod Dreher talks about. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think what's happening there is they're probably reacting to their own opinions of Rod Dreher and maybe even some some stereotypes of what he's doing in that work rather than really reacting to to what we're doing here but um, I enjoyed the book I found much that resonated in the book and like I said I'm, I'm very thankful for this particular cultural moment uh, that it's created I'm just careful not to make any link direct link between what we're doing and what he wrote because people have such disparate reactions both to his book and to the content on our website uh, you just said that uh, a lot of you've heard from a lot of people how's that been just a lot of people reaching out and, and interest that you think uh... yeah so it's been across the range so to get into the specific numbers i've probably heard from i'd say several dozen i'd have to look back because i keep records of of all inquiries and you know how i've been in touch with them but i'd say probably several dozen have reached out um, and it's everything from, um, you know, please put me on your, your mailing list because I'd like to track the progress and, you know, maybe someday up to really intense conversations where we'll set up a phone call or a Zoom and really do a get to know you. And um, at least in one case, somebody has applied for employment here in the local area. You know, they've, mm -hmm. they've taken that step to try to physically get here. Um, couple of things that I would say about that, of course, I, I don't want anybody precipitously to 
move and make a commitment and all these types of things, I definitely want a period of discernment where people take a long, hard look at, you know, what their calling is, whether they want to be physically in this location, whether they you know, want this, this rigor of daily prayer and all those things. And of course, secondly, the pandemic has complicated things because people aren't traveling as much. Yeah. And so uh, thank God for Zoom and other things like that. You know, we have been able to still have conversations and help people get on that path of discernment. Uh, but of course, I want people to actually come and visit, uh, see the area, see the, the community, pray together, this kind of thing. And, you know, we're somewhat limited in that way right now. What town is, is that that you're, um, this would be started in that people would, would look to, to relocate to? Yeah, so we're in Halifax County, and my family lives on a small farm just north of Scotland Neck, so somewhere in the area of the town of Scotland Neck. That is, for those who know North Carolina geography, we're about 40 miles north of Greenville, which is kind of the education and healthcare and arts, et cetera, epicenter for the eastern third of the state, uh, and we're about 90 miles northeast of Raleigh. Okay, so for people relocating to that area, would you want them to be within a certain geography or just kind of up to them, just um, generally adjacent to the area where you could gather? Or? Well, I think the practical thing to keep in mind is if somebody is gonna make the commitment to pray the daily office together, and of course we have to think about times of day and what that looks like and anticipating that there'll be some people with typical, you know, eight to five types of work and other people who are retired, we have to figure out what all that looks like as the community comes together. But the commitment to gather in person for morning prayer and evening prayer every day means that you're going to want to be pretty close, I should think. Um, you know, I don't think anybody's going to want to drive half an hour each way twice a day <laughs> to join in prayer. Um, so I would anticipate that people would need to be pretty close. One of our advantages is that we are in a rural area where the cost of living is very, very low. And we're sort of, uh, I gave our distance from Greenville. We're actually located somewhat centrally among about three mid-sized cities of about 100,000 people each. So I'd anticipate there'll probably be some people in retirement who say, that's the life I wanna spend in these, these this latter part of my life. There are other people who like myself, maybe telecommuting, working from home, which I've done in my secular work for about 20 years now. Uh, there may be some people who want to farm. Uh, we are in a very you know, farming intensive community. And there may be other people who commute to one of those three cities. So there's a number of different ways that somebody could put this together and, and have a lifestyle that works. But I think proximity for daily prayer is something they'd want to consider. In terms of the, the common buildings, would you want um, like a chapel or just kind of a, a meal, like a, a cafeteria kind of room where people come together for common meals? Or would you have in mind for the, the common buildings? Yeah, we have some things, exciting things uh, afoot in that regard in that we were able to purchase a small disused Episcopal church, um, lovely little country chapel. Hadn't been used in many years, but the inside is, is quite pretty. And we're excited about that. It needs to be moved. It's about 20 or 30 miles away. And so we're going to be moving and renovating that. So we've, we've made that purchase and are now just looking for the site that we're going to put it. So that will be the chapel for Sunday worship, the Sunday celebration of Holy Eucharist, and for morning and evening prayer on the rest of the, the days of the week. And hopefully we can find some building or maybe place it adjacent to another building that can be used as a, a hall with some rooms for common meals, classes, those types of things. So it will be a church. The, the search is underway. That's right. Okay. And uh, I did see uh, you mentioned pan-Anglicanism. I hadn't heard that term, but so I know, you know, there's been a few splits off of the Episcopal church and um, more, the more recent one, um, I believe is Anglican Church in North North America that might be under a bishop in Africa. My my family grew up at the Falls Church Episcopal in, in Virginia. So I know they joined that. Um, they left the Episcopal Church and they were kicked out of their historic building that George Washington had been in and all of that. But um, so how many different denominations? I've heard of Anglican Catholics and there's a few other 
not Roman Catholics, uh, but are there a few denominations in there that you're you're talking about, or or also there are about and Episcopalians that would just call themselves traditional uh, Anglicans, but are still associated with an Episcopal church? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to try to give an answer that doesn't make your listeners' eyes roll back in their head um, <laughs> and put them to sleep. When I was considering becoming an Anglican, there's this phrase, the the alphabet soup, because all the different Anglican groups and jurisdictions have their acronym. And so people refer to the alphabet soup of Anglicanism. And I always tell people that when I was considering becoming an Anglican, I became uh, familiar with the alphabet soup on a level that is probably not good for the soul. <laughs> but uh, to give us as straightforward an answer as possible, there are some, some additional Anglican groups out there, but it, there have been two uh, major moves away from the Episcopal Church uh, and, and its association with you know, some other churches in other countries in modern times. So one was in uh, 1979. Um, this is when there were some major changes, uh, a major revision to the Book of Common Prayer, which was seen by many as actually done on an agenda of changing the church's theology rather than just the language of the prayer book. And of course, that was associated with ordaining women to uh, holy orders to the priesthood and, and then to the episcopacy. So a group left, and somewhat ironically, uh, that group was originally called the Anglican Church in North America, which is uh, the name that was adopted by the, the later group, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But um, human personalities and egos and human sinfulness being what it is, that group soon splintered into several different groups. Uh, more recently, the Anglican Catholic Church, of which I'm a part, and three other traditional Anglican groups established, reestablished, I should say, full communion among ourselves. So the Anglican Catholic Church, the Anglican Province of America, the Anglican Church in America, and the Diocese of the Holy Cross all came together about three years ago now and reestablished full communion with the stated goal of working toward full organic unity. So that's a really, really hopeful sign for the future. The second group is now known as the ACNA, the Anglican Church in North America. And it's much more recent uh, in the early 2000s, as many people may know, uh, a man who was in an active homoerotic relationship, Gene Robinson, was selected for the Episcopacy and consecrated bishop. And for many who had remained in the Episcopal Church, that was uh, the last straw or a bridge too far. And of course, with much controversy and lawsuits over properties and all those sorts of lovely things, they pulled out and formed that structure. So there is an unfortunate uh, division still among Anglicanism. Like I said, there are definitely some hopeful signs, but with things as messy as they've been for the last 40 years, uh, I don't know if I termed or if I coined the term rather pan-Anglicanism, but I did use it uh, as an expression of what we would like the community of the Holy Cross to be because certainly people who, uh, like you say, may be traditionalist Episcopalians and still in that church, because uh, there are a few uh, people who are in the traditional Anglican groups that I mentioned, like myself and the ACC, people who are in ACNA and inclined toward uh, traditional expressions of faith and worship, or people in other groups. You know, I said uh, we also want to be ecumenical because this, this uh, separation of traditionalists um, from liberals has happened in almost all the mainline churches. So you see a parallel phenomenon in Lutheranism and Presbyterianism and a lot of different churches. And so one thing that I have found as I've engaged in these dialogues with folks around the country is that people are looking certainly for rich community life, but also for theological and spiritual substance. And those are the two things, community life and spiritual and theological substance that seem to appeal to most of the people who are considering being part of our community. So I think we'll probably end up with a wide diversity of backgrounds. It's kind of funny, one of the very first people to contact me was actually a Roman Catholic lady. And she said, you know, how, how could this work? I'm a Roman Catholic. Is there any way of my being part of your community? And I said, well, you would certainly be absolutely welcome if circumstances required you to if you discerned that you were called to be part of this community and you wanted to join us for morning and, and evening prayer, 
but your conscience required you to, to go up the street and attend Sunday mass at St. Anne's, um, you, you know, you would certainly be welcome and, and have my blessing in doing so. <laughs> so it'll be once again, fun to see just how diverse in background the community ends up being. That was going to be my, my question is, you know, a lot of the Protestant um, denominations, I feel like communion is, is a thing that's a barrier for, for the Catholics, even, um, I don't know how familiar you are with the ordinariate within the Catholic Church. There's an Anglican somewhat mm -hmm. or ordinariate, and um, they say that they, I guess, the Vatican allowed them use, to use the Anglican patrimony, you know, the the old Book of Common Prayer. So they're very similar to traditional right. Anglicans, but they kind of like the Uniate churches and the Orthodox. Some of them are have the same liturgy as the Orthodox, but are now in line with Rome. It seems like a similar setup. So I was thinking that could be um you know the only thing that might separate them from from participating would be communion like the roman catholic woman you mentioned but right well and the thing is i could i can easily envision that we might have multiple strata of participation uh if and when this thing you know comes together and comes to fruition so for instance i i do imagine there being a, a core group of people who are members of the community, committed to the goals of the community, pray together twice a day, every day, et cetera. There may be other people who do all of that, but they're Orthodox or they're Roman Catholic or they're whatever you like to name. Um, you know, they, they grew up at First Baptist and have been there their whole life and they still want to go there on Sunday morning. There's no reason they couldn't, you know, participate in the life of the community while sort of keeping one foot in the world they they came from, or in the, the case of Orthodox and Roman Catholics, you know, receiving Holy Communion in that setting on Sundays, that sort of thing. There may be also other people who just are in the community, are aware of us, and can't or aren't interested in committing to community membership, but who sort of come and go and participate in the life of prayer. You know, I could imagine somebody saying, oh, I come, I come every Tuesday evening and join you for Vespers, you know, that's just my personal habit, even though I'm not a member of the community. Um, so I can imagine, like I say, multiple strata, and we'll just see how things work out. So, you know, talking about pan-Anglicanism, and, you know, there's a lot of very devoted people in these these small sects that are starting to reunite, um, but I was, as somebody who's raised, uh, I guess, within the Anglican world, you know, is the Episcopal side of it, that, it, you know, seeing some of these numbers that they they put out every year on on attendance recently a seminary president uh said that uh the episcopal church was going to not have um sunday attendance within 30 years and um i wonder what you think about that as somebody who's been kind of within the anglican sphere just do you think that some of the more uh traditional churches will be able to buck that trend of a lot of the the mainline churches that are sort of seeing 20, 30 years that they might not have much Sunday attendance at all. Um, do you see things like uh, community uh, bringing people, holding people in and, and other traditional practices? Do you think that will help, you know, not lead more traditional Anglicans and more traditional Christians down a similar path? Or what are your thoughts on kind of the Episcopal, the main Episcopal church which is supposed to be the main Anglican church in the country and versus kind of what you're seeing in your ministry. Yeah, well, I think most folks who follow Church Matters are well aware of that demographic collapse that you're describing. But of course, it's also been the case in lots of other churches. Many of the mainline denominations have seen similar uh, demographic declines. It's uh, something that's happening in, in many places. I will say this, and without trying to be too pejorative and certainly not wanting to be unkind. The bottom line is, you know, our Lord himself said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And that has multiple layers of meaning. One, of course, is simply that he was prophesying about his own death on the cross and being lifted up as the perfect and eternal sacrifice for our salvation. But I think it's also the case that when we lift Christ up, that is when we preach the gospel, people are automatically and naturally drawn to it. If you look at any time in history, you will see that churches that grow, as we tend to 
talk about in somewhat marketing and consumerist term, the churches that grow are the ones who preach the gospel. I saw on social media, something that was flying around Facebook, this sort of uh, impassioned plea from an Episcopal layman to wake up and save the Episcopal church. And he's very, uh, obviously an educated man, articulate, but he talked in almost purely human terms about saving this human institution. And my response to that, I think he had written a book, you know, arguing his case that he was promoting and I wish him well, but the whole thing sounded like it was cast in such humanistic terms that my response was the key is repent and believe the gospel and all else is futile. Human institutions have a natural life cycle, just like the human body has a natural life cycle. If we maintain the body really well through nutrition and exercise and good health care, we can maximize it to its limit, but it still has a limit. Human institutions can be carried forth by education, by prosperity, by all sorts of things, but they still have a, a limit. The reason the church exists in the world, and I'll let listeners put whatever definition they want for the purpose of this statement around church, and we can talk about my understanding of what the church is if you'd like, but the reason the church still exists while empires have risen and fallen, human institutions come and go and hold denominations may disappear is because it is not a solely human institution. It is a human institution, but it is a, it is a divine institution. Its breath is the Holy Spirit. Its heart is celebration of the Holy Eucharist. And the church endures insofar as she is what Christ intended her to be and preaches the gospel. So got a little far afield there, but I think it's a very important point to understand. So those churches that wish to reverse their demographic decline, whether they be Protestant churches, the Episcopal church, which I don't consider a Protestant church, I place it in a different category, other churches, if you want to arrest your demographic decline, preach the gospel, which of course is kind of ironic because all the things that churches tend to do instead of preaching the gospel are the things that they think are going to drive growth, <laughs> be it you know, political activism, be it entertainment as a substitute for worship, be it a thousand activities every week for families to participate in, all those things that churches do, they think, well, these are the things that are going to get people here. And it's really counterintuitive, but the thing that will get people there is the gospel, because you don't need to make the gospel relevant. The gospel comes with its own relevance because it is the solution to the human condition. As soon as we start thinking in terms of making ourselves relevant, making the gospel relevant, we're already on the wrong path because we have implied that the gospel needs to be made relevant, whereas the gospel is always directly relevant to anyone who hears it preached. I wonder what you think about, um, <clears throat> I, I agree that, you know, the gospel's always relevant. It seems somewhat that we're answering a question that a lot of millennials or or the the popular culture at the moment isn't asking which is you know christianity is based on the idea that there's that part of human anthropology is this um evil uh at least potential for evil and and i don't think a lot of <clears throat> a lot of people in the modern culture would see that as judgmental that you don't want to be intolerant of other people's actions or beliefs uh, they want to keep a lot of things open in that area and they maybe don't see each person as having to create the same character one person at a time they see you know um, society can just progress over time we can kind of build off of you know basically progressivism where you can progress as a society so you don't need to focus on e the e evil inside of each one of us um, i think they don't look at it that way so it almost does feel like we're answering a question they're not asking so to me, sometimes does it feel like you almost have to start by convincing them that we are in fact flawed and evil and, and then before they can look at Christ as a solution to that problem, they have to sort of, the culture has to be shown that that actually is an issue. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting way of putting the problem. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think what you're describing is something that I've observed many times, which is that, you know, there are these the debates what is the real uh, 
the real religion of America? What is the real worldview of America? What, what are we really at our heart? And I don't think we started out this way, but certainly as a culture, I think we are now existentialist, at least a kind of popularized, babblerized version of existentialism is our national religion now. And of course, it loops very nicely into that, that radical autonomy that we discussed earlier. Um, but I'll tell you, as you were talking, I, I agree that people are sort of functioning existentialists, and therefore there's no common uh, belief in my need to be saved or you know my need to achieve a particular moral standing or anything like that. But where my mind went as you were posing the question was this very interesting moment several years ago. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm bivocational. I make my living in the software industry. I've mostly worked for companies based in San Francisco and the surrounding area, which puts me in, um, you know, kind of a cultural milieu that may not entirely overlap with what we're doing at the community of the Holy Cross, shall we say. <laughs> um, and I was in this meeting and a very, very successful Silicon Valley CEO. So this guy's been in that world his whole career, his whole life made a statement that was just so striking to me. And I forget the business point that he was making. He went on to make some practical business point about our business. But as soon as he, he said what I'm about to repeat, my mind, of course, went off in another direction. Um, he said, you know, everyone asks themselves three questions. Everybody's concerned about the same three questions. Why am I here? Where am I going? And what happens when I die? And I thought, what an absolutely prophetic moment that this very successful software executive living in San Francisco Bay Area, working in that cultural milieu, would say, now, really, when it comes right down to it, we all ask these three questions. Um, which is really, if you think about it, exactly the opposite of what existentialism would urge. Because first of all, he's he's implying the existence of human nature. Because we can't have six or seven billion people all asking themselves the three questions without having a nature that is in common and therefore predictable and therefore with certain needs, with a certain teleology, with a certain origin. He's saying human nature exists even though he didn't use those words. Secondly, he's saying there are big questions that stem from that nature that are common to all of us. And some people make their life an exercise in answering those questions and getting the answers right. And some people maybe ignore those questions. And when, they're, when the back of their mind starts whispering those questions, it's turn on Netflix, go shopping for a sports car, go have the next sexual encounter, you know, whatever it may be to tune it out. <laughs> um, but it's still there. And it was just so interesting to me to hear somebody of that background and in that setting make that claim about people. So I think we're sort of a culture trying to sell ourselves on existentialism, but in our hearts, we don't really buy it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Um, and so you're talking of, um, I was reminded when you're when you're talking, you know, in your website, you were saying that you wanted to have a lot of catechesis, um, you know, bring people to an apostolic and and um, you know a faith that's based off the church fathers and and the whole of Christian tradition. Um, how do you? plan on on doing that is that going to be sort of uh in addition to the sunday church services you'll have some kind of um curriculum that they'll go through of of teaching uh trying to get people kind of to see that that long apostolic tradition and and how it's still you know it hasn't been changing every time somebody like the episcopal church or press you know pc usa church take go off in another direction that that doesn't change Christianity as it has been as a, as a tradition that's more solid or? Yeah, so I'm sure, well, a number of things. First of all, any of us who have minor children, as I do, uh, catechesis and formation are an active, pressing daily concern, uh, which is why you have throughout history, you know, 
private schools formed by Christians and Sunday schools on Sunday morning and Bible studies and Christian youth groups and a whole variety of things. Because for anybody who's raising children, that's always a pressing concern. And some sort of structure of study is always created. So it's a matter of getting the right content. Um, but secondly, as I look at people who are attracted to what we're trying to do, and if you think about people who want to pray in a traditional and deeply scriptural way with their brothers and sisters in Christ twice a day, who's that going to attract? Probably people who own a lot of books. <laughs> Probably people who, not exclusively maybe, but people who care about learning, in other words. I'm being a little facetious in the way that I say it. But people who really care about learning, who care about the life of the mind, who care about richness and depth and how they spend their time. So I think it, it will be pretty easy with people who will be attracted to this kind of life and are called to this kind of life. There might be uh, too, too many ideas and too many things we want to read and study and not enough hours in the day to do it, as a matter of fact. But I think another important element to consider is, and one that's of concern to me, is that in so many churches across a wide variety of, of denominational allegiances, there's been a substitution of entertainment in place of worship. And people are looking for something far more substantive. And I know when I say that, a lot of people will immediately think of you know, the churches where there's basically a rock concert followed by a religious TED talk, as I heard somebody recently say. And certainly those churches are in that category of having, having replaced worship with entertainment. But I think it, it's a problem in a lot of churches. You know, I grew up in a setting where very frequently the quality of preaching was measured at the end of the day by how entertaining it was. So even though we didn't have, you know, the rock and roll concert and the laser light show, we were still making oftentimes that mistake of coming to church for religiously themed entertainment. Um, I've even heard in, in some very high church settings, Anglican and Roman Catholic, I've seen the celebration of Holy Eucharist essentially turned into a classical music concert. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, the quality of music is very important in worship. But the question is, is music supporting worship or is, is music and high culture and trying to have a particular aesthetic and sensory experience not so much supporting worship as supplanting worship? So as I say, I've seen this pattern in a wide variety of ecclesial settings. And of course, worship is actually two things. It's, it's not entertainment. It's not having a particular aesthetic experience. For Christians, worship is offering the adoration to God, which is his due as our creator. We belong to him. We are his creation. We are the sheep of his fold. And so that latria, that worship, that ultimate adoration that we give to no one else is offered to him. That's one of the things we do in worship. The other thing that is an essential component of worship is to be formed in a way that is pleasing to him, to be made Christ-like, by sound preaching, by prayer, and by the reception of the sacraments. And so when you bring people together, to, to bring this back to your question, people who understand what worship is, adoring God and being formed in a way that is pleasing to him, you're going to want to dig in and, and learn more. All sorts of questions come with that, like how have Christians worshipped throughout time and space? and all the doctrinal things that come with knowing God so that we may love and serve him. A you know, relationship is never just knowledge. It's not just cognitive, but it's always, it always starts with knowledge. It always starts out cognitively. When you have a brand new colleague, a brand new neighbor, you may ultimately become, go on to become very close friends, so close that you can read each other's minds and finish each other's sentences. But how does that begin? It begins with knowledge. It begins with getting to know you. Where are you from? Do you have children? What do you do for a living? What are your hobbies? So relationship always starts with knowledge. And so that's why sound catechesis and study are so important. Hmm. Yeah, it reminded me a little bit when you're talking about it being entertainment. I read a book called, uh, I think it was Power of Science by Cardinal Robert Serra. He's a Roman Catholic cardinal from Africa. But he went on a lot on that where just modern worship 
has so much noise and there's a dictatorship of noise in our modern culture already and a lot of people are looking for more silence that is a place they can go in and and meet god in that silence rather than flashing lights and sounds but people aren't really w uh, willing in the modern age they don't have the uh attention or they feel uncomfortable in silence so they can't really use that in worship that in a way that prior uh generations had and feel comfortable in it and um so i thought that was an interesting point that he made there but um I felt that way in, in some church services when I became Christian, when, when they would start to, uh, more evangelical ones, when the pastor would start to pray, the guy on the keyboards would come in and it felt a little emotionally manipulative. Like it is, the, Manipulation is the word that immediately came to mind when you described that, which of course I've seen in a wide variety of settings and with my background. But yeah, achieving a particular emotional state um, is, it's, it's an idol. Um, but it is what happens in a lot of places. And as I say, there's no one type of church that does that. I've seen that done with very beautiful masses, and I've seen that done with, you know, the laser light show rock concert, a happy clappy type of church. It really runs the gamut. But if you're going there to achieve a particular emotional experience, that's a very different thing than adoring God and being formed in a way that is pleasing to him. And it can be, it can be quite deceptive because, of course, the person who does that is thinking about the, the emotional high that they achieved, and they're thinking about uh, the regular, you know, I attend church every Sunday and I do all these things, you know, how can you say that I'm not worshiping God? But if our goal is to be titillated and feel a certain way, whether that's by very beautiful high culture or, you know, rock and roll or whatever, it's it's a substitute for worship and, and very deceptive yeah and the danger of that too can be then if they don't if they aren't on that spiritual high anymore then they might doubt their faith or think god abandoned them if they have the absolutely dark night of the soul kind of period in their life then they'll be like well that means you know i, I question god's existence now because he's not here with me because here with me means emotionally satisfying me how i want to be satisfied so. absolutely I was going to say something else too about that that discomfort with silence, and I would say even you know not only discomfort with silence, which is certainly a characteristic of modern life, but also discomfort with routine, discomfort with certain forms of self discipline and so forth that's true of of all of us in our current culture to one degree or another, but I always think of that very much in terms of um once again, the existence of the physical body. So if you've been living a diet of junk food, the first time you're served a really healthy meal, you usually don't enjoy the experience very much. Yeah. Um, but if you stick with it, you wake up one day, so many people who have, you know, radically changed their lives. You see these stories of people who, you know, got serious about their health and lost 150 pounds and all this. And they all have this breakthrough moment when they get up one morning and go, I feel really good. I'm not used to feeling this good. I'm not used to being able to think this clearly. I'm not used to being having this much energy throughout the day. You know, they have that moment of epiphany of, wow, I feel really good. I guess this is because of the way I've been eating and I want to, I want to maintain this stasis. I think with silence, with liturgical prayer, you know, which some may find boring and that kind of thing, there's a similar phenomenon where silence may be very uncomfortable for you at first. And, your head may be going all sorts of places, um, but if you stick with it for a while, suddenly you realize, I can think more clearly, I enjoy this experience, and ultimately you may even realize, I hear the voice of the Holy Spirit much better than I used to. Hmm. Um, and so even though it may not be the most pleasing experience at first when we take on a more disciplined life of prayer, I think ultimately, once again, because it has its own relevance, it is the answer to our needs, we'll ultimately find that it, uh, you know, is very pleasing to us, even on a, a purely human level. And everybody struggles with that sort of thing. I remember a while back, I, much to the amusement of my friends, I, I posted a, a true story on YouTube. Um, I was trying to, you know, 
bring contemplative prayer into my daily routine of spending a, a little time each morning attempting contemplative prayer. And for those of you who, are not, uh, who may be listening and not familiar with the term, contemplative prayer is prayer in which you present yourself to God with absolutely no mediating forms. In other words, you're not meditating on scripture, even though that's a very good thing to do. You're not picturing anything in your mind. You're, you're emptying your mind. You're emptying your thoughts, being very quiet and still before God. So there's no particular content. You're just placing yourself in his presence and love and faith. And I was doing this one day and I realized that very quietly, the back of my brain was playing Kenny Rogers, the gambler. <laughs> That's an absolutely true story. And so here I am thinking, you know, I'm going to practice contemplative prayer. And so, you know, we all struggle with all sorts of, of stuff, some very good, some cultural rubbish. Um, but, but we all struggle with that. But if we do try to make silence, we try to make the daily office, we try to make regular perception of the sacraments part of our lives, we can at least, um, we're, we're a lot better off than, uh, than where we might have been. So we not just incorporated to, those things in our day. Yeah, just to, to bring this back around a little bit to your community, if you were to look, you know, 10 years from now, and if everything, I guess some of it you say you're, you're willing for, you know, obviously the spirit to lead it somewhere that you're not sure where that would be, but how would you envision, you know, you have a community that's, you know, um, doing this twice daily um, book of common prayer. You have a lot of silent uh, contemplative practices and community around sacraments and meals and, and faith. What would, what would that look like to you if all of what you're envisioning kind of unfolds in a, a positive way? Like, do you have uh, an idea of what that would look like? I do. At the risk of, of being a smarty pants, I'm going to give a, a provisional answer and say, well, I, I can honestly say, not just because this is the right answer, I can honestly say that in my heart of hearts, I hope there is no 10 years from now because I hope the Lord Jesus has returned and established his kingdom. I would be absolutely delighted if there were no 10 years from now. <laughs> and I say that because, you know, we're, we're in a pretty dark and distressing time in human history on many fronts right now. Um, but Assuming that, as we used to say in the, the Baptist churches I grew up in, if the Lord tarries uh, for another 10 years or longer, um, what I envision is this. I would hope that we would have a community that was substantial enough numerically to execute splendid liturgy and to, to do some real things in terms of ministry in the community without ever becoming remotely like uh, a, a huge sprawling community where people don't know each other or a mega church or anything like that. I really do think there is a magic number. Um, and if we ever hit that magic number as a community, then it will be time for somebody to go form another similar community in another place. Uh, so I would hope that we would reach that um, sort of critical mass to worship well, to do the works of mercy well, to educate well, but without it becoming unmanageable. I would hope that both morning and evening prayer would be celebrated um, with due reverence, with music, um, chanting the Psalms, you know, that sort of thing. Sunday Eucharist, the same. I would hope there would be a few specific ministries, not trying to be everything to everybody, but a few specific ministries that the Holy Spirit has directed us to in our community where we're making a real and substantial difference. Um, I think if there's anything else. Oh, one other thing. I, I would hope that we would get to a point where we have uh, enough people and a space appropriate for there to be constant adoration and intercession 24-7, 365, because mm -hmm. I think that can be a really powerful ministry. You know, there are religious disorders who've done that. There are other groups of people who have done that. One of the, the many historical precedents for what we're trying to do is the community that Nicholas Farrar and uh, his extended family put together at Little Gidding in England in the 17th century. And uh, they ultimately reached a point where someone was in the, pray, in the chapel praying for the church and the world 24 hours a day, seven days a week at all times. And it actually became a significant center of pilgrimage as a result. 
Um, but I would love to get to the point where we could actually achieve that as part of our vocation of intercessory prayer. Well, great. I think um, unless you have something else you want to add real quick in terms of uh, things you want people to know about your community um, that we didn't cover or plans or ways to get in touch with you. I think a lot of that's on the website. They have um, contact it information. Is. Um, the community or the uh, URL rather is community dash holy dot org and my personal phone number and email address are both there so feel free to reach out would love to hear from anybody who feels they may be called to this well great well i really appreciate you taking uh an hour out of your day to to speak to me and i definitely wish you you luck and i'm looking forward to seeing how this um moves forward so thanks a lot again for no, thank you so me. much Really, really appreciate your interest. It's been a, a lovely conversation.